Tonight's events are part of the two-day North Carolina Conference on Latin American Studies, a collaboration between the UNC Duke Consortium on Latin American and Caribbean Studies and the Latin American Studies Program at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. My colleague, Jurgen Buchenau, Professor of History and Latin American Studies at UNC Charlotte, will share more about the conference and tonight's speaker, Edwin Castellanos. Thank you. I don't think this is going to work. But yeah. try. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, welcome, everybody. And I'm really pleased that all of us are part of the first Nicholas Conference, uh, North Carolina Conference on Latin American Studies. Uh, this is basically a, an outgrowth from the consortium conference that has uh, happened here for the past 28 or some years uh, that has happened between UNC and Duke. And really a, an ambitious idea, I think, developed particularly by Lou Paris the director of the uh, Institute for the Study of the Americas here at UNC uh, Chapel Hill, who's always thought bigger and dreamt bigger and thought that we needed to um, be a statewide conference. So welcome, everybody, to this first statewide conference on Latin American studies. And I do see quite a few people here from, uh, from Western North Carolina. Um, I, it, we hope that this will not be a one-off event. And I can already tell you proudly that next year's event will be hosted sometime in February at UNC Charlotte. We'll probably host it at our center city campus so that attendees can take advantage of our cultural amenities in Charlotte. And I know that you, you're all from the triangle. You think, what cultural amenities in Charlotte? <laughs> right? um, uh, first of all, I think that the Panthers are more, excited than the, uh, more exciting than the hurricanes. But apart from that, um, we do have museums and uh, we uh, so we have a lot of, uh, we, ha we have opera, we, uh, we're a cultural center in Western North Carolina that's really excited to host you all pr probably a year from now. Um, I want to thank uh, the sponsors of Nicholas 2019, and those include the U.S. Department of Education, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the UNC Chapel Hill Center for the Study of the American South, the UNC Chapel Hill College of uh, Arts and Sciences, UNC Worldview and the UNC Charlotte College of uh, Latin American Studies. It is now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce today's speaker, Edwin J. Castellanos. And uh, I'm really pleased that uh, Dr. Castellanos is here. Uh, obviously, with a lot of these keynotes, uh, we're getting a very, uh, a very important uh, scholarly presentation. But tonight's scholarly presentation actually matters to everybody. Uh, not just to people in Latin American studies, uh, but people who, uh, who live in the northern uh, part of the uh, American um, double continent. Uh, because obviously his work on migration and climate change is of paramount uh, importance. Uh, Dr. Castellanos got his uh, PhD in environmental science from uh, Indiana University in 2001. And before that, got a uh, master in science in, in, the, in analytical chemistry for Michigan State. And uh, let me just tell you a few things about him. I don't want to say too much to, uh, in order to um, allow him to have most of the time. 20, 20 years of continuous work and research and education in Guatemala and Mesoamerica in the topic of natural resource management and environmental uh, sanitation, particularly in the area of climate change, where he participated as lead author of the fifth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and a coordinating lead author in the sixth report in the chapter of Vulnerability and Adaptation for Central and South America. He also uh, participated in uh, COP21 in Paris in December 2015 as the, uh, the National Commissioner on Climate Change. He's a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for, for Global Change Research, member of the Science Leadership Council for the Mountain Research in, uh, Initiative, member of the External Advisory Council for uh, World Wildlife Fund Latin America, and member of the Alliance for Climatic Re Resilience in Rural Latin America. He is the university representative before the National Council for Climate Change, the highest de decision body on climate change issues for Guatemala. He's been the principal investigator in multiple projects at the national and regional level on the topic of uh, adaptation to climate change by rural and small uh, farmer communities. He has also uh, led the studies for the past 15 years on re uh, monitoring uh, deforestation and studying the causes for that problem in Guatemala as part of the National 
reduce emissions from deforestation and degra degradation initiatives and other initiatives to develop carbon offset projects. Dr. Castellanos also promoted the creation and served for those years as the Secretary of the Guatemalan System for Climate Change Sciences, a network of research centers that provides scientific advice up to decision makers. He received the National Medal for Science and Technology in 2016, and he was a global visiting scholar at RTI International in 2017, doing research on uh, water mo modeling. Currently, he is the dean of the Research Institute at the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala, and we very much welcome uh, Dr. Edwin Castellanos. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, especially before such an interesting crowd uh, on a Friday evening. I hear it's very rainy outside, so I'm uh, very pleased to see uh, 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 such a large group interested in climate change in Central America. I was thinking that maybe because I'm going to talk about global warming, you were interested because it's been so cold in the last days, at least cold for me coming from Guatemala. But the question today is whether we can see a link between climate change and, and migration. And this uh, has been a, a, a question in uh, many people's mind. For the past six months, I've been getting um, calls by uh, reporters uh, from the US and m many different uh, media asking the same question. Uh, th there's been a, a large uh, influx of migrants, uh, is especially in caravans, uh, moving uh, to, towards the U.S. in the last month. And the question is, uh, why, why is that happening? Uh, can we see anything unusual happening in the last years that can explain the situation? Well, we're going to try to, to discuss uh, some of the possible factors for, for this situation. Uh, but uh, in doing so, I'm also going to explain a little bit of uh, what climate change is doing in Central America. Uh, before getting to the question of climate change and migration, I'm going to give you the quick answer to the question. Uh, and basically, when uh, reporters uh, call me and ask me this question, the answer is maybe. And so that's an answer that reporters hate to hear. Now they want to see yes or no. But when I say maybe, it's like, ah. Uh. But maybe, because what happens is that migration is a very complex uh, process and it is very difficult to pinpoint a single factor where you can say, well, people are migrating because of this or because of that. Also, whenever I talk to uh, migration experts, many of them sitting here in this room, they always say, well, we know that uh, migration has been uh, going on for, for, for so many years, and the extreme weather events that I'm going to describe have, have only happened in the last 10 to 15 years. So we know that there is more to climate uh, in, uh, for people to migrate. And if we are looking for sus suspects in terms of uh, migration, at least in Central America, uh, to my guess, would have to be poverty. And uh, this graph over here is showing how uh, poverty is such a, an important issue in Central America. What we see here, and it might be hard for you to read down here, is uh, everybody representing a country in Latin America and the colors in the bars showing the different uh, poverty levels of the population. So the light green shows the extreme poverty, the green shows the poverty, uh, the next color will show the risk of becoming poor, and then the, the darker color shows people who are not at risk of poverty. Mm -hmm. So basically what we see here is all the countries, in, uh, the main countries in Latin America uh, Argentina on this side, and then at, the end, at, the, at this end we see the countries with the highest rate of poverty. And what we see is that uh, out of the five countries with the highest rate of poverty in Latin America, four of them are in Central America. Honduras is right here, and we see that the level of poverty can reach as high as over 70%. Next to it we have Nicaragua. Only Paraguay is the country that is not in Central America, but is there in the top five. Then next to uh, Paraguay, we have Guatemala, right here, and El Salvador. So four out of the five poorest countries in, the, in Latin America are actually located in Central America. And uh, as we can see here, 
the percentage of poverty in the region is uh, quite high, reaching uh, well above 50%. If we um, look at this graph down here, we see the historical trend in poverty levels in Central and South America. And uh, the red line represents Central America, South America is the blue line. We can see that South America uh, has lower poverty uh, rates, but overall we see that we have been doing um, an okay job trying to reduce poverty in the region. The problem is that uh, even from 1990, where poverty rates in Central America were up to 60%, we have only been able to reduce it to just above 40%. And this average in Central America is including Costa Rica and Panama, two countries with relatively uh, high living standard. And so this average over here is actually um, being skewed by these two countries. The, what, what we are trying to, to prove here is that uh, over half of the people in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua are living below the poverty line. So they are already having a hard time uh, surviving and finding a way to, to make a living. And over here, uh, we see numbers that show that uh, uh, the, the people who migrate out of the region mainly come into the U.S., some of them staying in Mexico, and sending money back to their countries are actually help, helping uh, their economies in a huge way. For example, this is, this is the percentage of the, um, uh, the GDP that, uh, um, that comes from remittances in, in each one of these countries. In Honduras, uh, one out of uh, five dollars uh, produced in the country is actually coming from, from abroad, uh, sent by, by uh, immigrants. And similar figures we see for El Salvador, in Guatemala is one out of ten dollars. So we see that the economy is actually uh, heavily supported by the money being sent from people here uh, in the U.S. mainly. Just now, I was reading uh, a news uh, from the Central Bank in Guatemala reporting that our economical growth for, for this past year was uh, more, a little bit higher than normal, just about 3%, 3% being the normal. And they were attributing this uh, economic uh, growth of 3% in good part because the remittances have been higher than usual in the last years. And so definitely we, we can see how uh, the money uh, of, uh, being produced by people in, in this country are helping uh, uh, people down there. Even, even in places like El Salvador, at this 100% uh, indicates that uh, the um, uh, money sent from, uh, from here is uh, a li even a little bit higher than the actual uh, export money uh, being uh, produced within the country. So uh, remittances are extremely important in a highly impoverished uh, area. The other important suspect uh, when we uh, think about why people are leaving their home places is uh, violence. And unfortunately here we also see um, uh, statistics that show that the area is in uh, a very um, bad situation. The, the, these numbers are uh, showing uh, how many people uh, have been victims of homicides uh, counted by 100,000 inhabitants the, for the year 2017. And, and the three countries in the northern part of Central America, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, all show extremely uh, high values. Uh, a lot of this violence is actually coming from uh, drug trafficking. Uh, a lot of the drugs coming from Colombia to the U.S. have to go through here because the trip from Colombia to the U.S. is too long to make it in a, in a one stretch. So a lot of the drugs stop right here in this area and that stopover actually makes the region uh, extremely violent. And uh, especially in the border areas, uh, border of Guatemala, Honduras, border of Mexico and Guatemala, that's where you see a lot of this violence happening. And so many people living in these rural areas close to the border not only are living in a very difficult situation because of poverty, but they are also living in a difficult situation because of this uh, extreme violence. So those two are main suspects and those two are pro most likely the main causes of why people feel so uh, um, moved to, to leave their, their homeland. But tonight, uh, I uh, offered to you that I was going to talk about global warming. And so uh, I'm going to start by showing this uh, graph that shows, uh, looks a little bit complicated, but 
I don't want to uh, give you the impression that uh, global warming is complicated. It's actually quite simple. But I'm going to run you through the graph to explain what's going on here. The black line over here represents uh, the actual measured temperatures in the planet. And so the black line represents the average temperature for the entire planet. We see that from 1860 to uh, 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 over year 2000, the temperature uh, seemed to be fairly stable, but then at the end, it goes up, uh, starting in 1960, 1970. Now, uh, the, re the black line is the measure uh, data. The red line represents uh, the, um, the model that scientists have created to try to reconstruct this information. Now, the red line on the top uh, graph represents uh, the model if we only use natural variables in that model. For example, if we only use changes in uh, solar radiation, if we only use uh, changes in the cloud cover for, for, for the planet, then the model shows uh, this over here. Uh, we can see, uh, if <laughs> we can almost see that uh, the, the model uh, actually doesn't match the black line if we only consider natural forcing, if we only consider natural variables. The only way that the model is going to match the measured data is if we add human variables to the model. So the bottom graph over here shows what the model is doing if uh, we add these human variables. It's the same information we see over here. The top, the top graph shows the colors of what the temperature, ch temperature changes were expected if we, if we only consider natural variables. Uh, the center one shows what we are actually seeing in the, in, in, the, in the last 50 or 60 years. And then over here we see what the model is predicting if we include human variables into the model. So basically, we can only <coughs> reconstruct what we have seen in the last 50 years if we include uh, human-related uh, variables to the models. This has led the IPCC, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scientists, to to conclude that uh, humans are causing the warming with a probability of 95%. So there's still a 5% chance that this is incorrect, but in science, most of you are familiar with this, 95% is pretty much uh, uh, um, certain uh, in terms of uh, science uncertainty. The other important issue to think about here is that this warming uh, over here is happening in, in uh, about 50 years. It's a warming of about one degree. Now, uh, an argument that you have probably heard before is, well, the planet has always warmed before. Uh, we have always had cycles of uh, warm weather and cold weather. We have always had these uh, ice ages, you know? And then we get warm periods in between the ice ages. So how come now that we are getting this warm are getting so concerned? Well, when we, when we, whenever we get these ice ages and whenever we get these warm periods, the changes in temperature occur over thousands of years. And so uh, a, a warming of one degree under normal condition should happen in 1,000 years. But here we are seeing that in less than 100 years, we are seeing the same warming. And so this quick warming is extremely unusual. And as I explained just now, it cannot be explained just by natural variables. So the problem is that the warming is happening too fast. And because the warming is happening too fast, Ecosystems and humans and animals and plants do not have enough time to adapt to these changes. When, when the ice ages and the warming, the natural warming happens, the, the, the periods of thousands of years are enough for species to move back and forth, and therefore they can adapt to these changes. When the warming happens so fast, it's uh, not enough time for, for a species to adapt. And, if, and even now, if, if a species want to move up and down to adapt to these changes, oftentimes they find walls that prevent them from moving, and therefore that becomes a, even a bigger problem. So uh, enough with, with this graph, we're gonna move on uh, about climate change. The only other issue I wanna raise with you right here is something that you probably know, but maybe you haven't seen it in a graph, is why we have this situation. Why are we in this problem? Well, this graph over here, oh, sorry, this graph represents uh, all the emissions of polluting gases to the atmosphere and who are producing those pollutants. Each, uh, the size of each square represents the amount of pollution by different regions of the world. The largest square over here represents Asia and uh, uh, the Pacific uh, Asia. 
And so this square over here is including China, and therefore the square is so big. Next to this square, we have Canada and United States. Only two countries account for 15% of the pollution, at least in 2011. The data is a little bit old, but the trends are pretty much uh, similar nowadays. So two countries account for 15% of the pollution. Next to Canada and, Lat and, and United States, we see Latin America with a number nine, meaning that the rest of the continent, all the countries south of the US, only add to 9% of the pollution. And this square over here has 9% because we have two uh, big countries included in there, Mexico and Brazil. If we were to remove Mexico and Brazil, the square would be probably become 1%. If we were to focus only in, Latin, in Central America, the square would be so small that you wouldn't be able to see it. Latin America is only contributing to 0.4% or less of the pollution that is being produced around the, the globe. And so we have a situation here where a region that is not really uh, contributing significantly to the pollution is receiving a, a strong uh, impact from that pollution. And that we can see in the next slide. Central America overall being located uh, in, in this tropical region has, uh, has normally had a very uh, variable uh, climate. So our climate in Central America has, has always been very extreme. The graph over here shows uh, the number of hurricanes that go through the area. Uh, this is uh, the number of hurricanes, I think, in the last century. So we see that uh, definitely we are right there in the middle of uh, the, the path for most of the hurricanes. And so we have always had extreme weather in that sense. But the graph over here shows that that high variability that we see normally in Central America is going to be even higher under the climate change scenarios. This graph over here was produced by this uh, Italian uh, climatologist, and basically the size of the dot, of the red dot, indicates how uh, much uh, we uh, scientists are expecting to see a change in climate in different regions. If we see that uh, the, the bigger dots are really in the northern part of, of, the, of the planet, uh, then what, what we're seeing is that we are expecting more changes as we get closer to the North Pole. But if we focus only on tropical areas, we see that the biggest dot is right there in Central America. So the conclusion of this study was that Central America is expected to be uh, the region uh, most responsive to climate change, meaning Central America is expected to be the region where the climate is going to change the most, at least in the tropical area. So we have a situation in which we have a region not being responsible for the pollution, but a region receiving a lot of the burden of the pollution. And that's when we start hearing things uh, related to social injustice, because what the, 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 the countries are polluting are not really the countries receiving uh, the burden of that pollution. And that's part of the political discussion uh, worldwide. Now, what does it look like on the ground? Uh, if we look at uh, maps and dots, then it's not really uh, making a, a lot of sense when we talk about people. But if we, if we talk about Guatemala in particular, uh, we, we basically have a story of uh, two children, El Niño and La Niña. And these two children somehow have become very aggressive in the last years. In, in, the, in the first decade of this century, we had uh, uh, a lot of influence of La Nina, the female ch child. And La Nina brought to us a lot of rainfall. It is important to remember that El Nino and La Nina are not uh, climate change per se. El Nino and La Nina are uh, events that have always happened in our region and that affect the climate in our region. But what we have seen in the past uh, two decades is that the intensity of these events, El Niño and La Niña, have become, um, have become more severe and also more frequent. In the past, we have seen El Niño and La Niña normally would happen only every five to seven years. But now we see that uh, these events are more and more uh, recurrent. So at the turn of the century, starting in 1998, we had a strong event happening through Central America, Hurricane Mitch. And that uh, showed the beginning of a uh, decade of extreme uh, rainfall. 
So in, in uh, 1998, we had Mitch, and after Mitch, we had a series of hurricanes going through the area, uh, all of them impacting tremendously uh, the population and the infrastructure of the country. And even years like 2007 and 2008, we did not have any tropical storms going through the country, just heavy rainfall. And heavy rainfall was enough to produce a lot of casualties and a lot of damage uh, in the infrastructure. And so basically we have uh, a history of uh, the beginning of this uh, century being uh, with too much rain. So much so that um, the, the government of Guatemala recognized that there was something going on. Uh, this, this many uh, events uh, were enough for Congress in Guatemala to pass a climate change law in 2013. We were one of the first countries to have a law uh, mandating the government to do something about climate change. And this was in part the result of everybody noticing uh, how much the, 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 the um, climate was changing. Uh, this also summarizes uh, some of that information. We can see how uh, if we um, account for how many extreme events there have been in the region, here we are talking about Latin America as a whole, uh, if we move from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, we see that in, at the turn of the century, the amount of extreme events, especially of uh, storms and the flooding happening from those storms increased dram dramatically. And the problem is that uh, each one of these events, especially the large uh, hurricanes, were impacting the countries so much in Central America that uh, the economic loss was pretty much equivalent to the, to the economic growth of that year. For example, when, when Mitch uh, uh, went through Honduras and, El Sa and, and, and Guatemala, the, the losses were uh, pretty much as high as how much the, the uh, country grew that year. So basically, instead of having economic growth that year, we actually uh, lost. But um, not only that, the problem was that uh, the, the hurricanes were so recurrent that people did not have time to recover. So we had one hurricane in 98, then we had another hurricane in 2003, another one in 2005, 2010. And so people were not even recovering from the previous event and then we had a, a different event. So this is basically La Nina. This is basically the effect of too much rain coming from an extreme La Nina event happening mainly around this time. Now, at some point, uh, uh, these extreme events uh, started to, to indicate how vulnerable we were. And um, this graph over here is just showing uh, how different it is to, to live in a developed country versus a developing country when you're facing such extreme events. Each one of these red dots uh, represent uh, the, the risk of being impacted by an extreme event. And this is for the 1980s and this is for uh, 2000s, no? Uh, the red dots uh, represent the risk if you are in a developing country. The black dot represent the risk if you are in a developed country. So two things to see here. The risk in a developed country is much lower than the risk in a developing country. But then we also see that uh, from the 80s to uh, 2000, the risk increased dramatically in a developing country, whereas in a developed country, there was an increase, but barely noticeable, you know? And, and basically, this is what you see uh, when, you, when you hear the news about a hurricane coming to, through the area, you know? If the hurricane goes through Cuba, if the hurricane goes through Haiti, you oftentimes hear of uh, hundreds or even thousands of casualties. When the hurricane hits the US, the organization here is so good that the casualties uh, drop drastically. So there's a huge difference on how countries can face uh, such extreme events depending on the level of organization, depending on the amount of resources available to confront such extreme events. So we are talking about too much rain starting in 1998 uh, up to about year 2012 mainly uh, influenced by La Nina. Uh, all of a sudden, it uh, looks like somebody uh, closed the, the tap. Somebody uh, said, well, not too much water. OK, let's stop the water. So in 2013, we started to see a decrease uh, in the rainfall. Rather than having La Nina, then we had a Nino coming in. Whenever we have a Nino in the region, we get low rainfall. 
and we started to have El Nino conditions in 2013, and they have been uh, like that since then. So we have had at least five years or six years of El Nino condition, something that is very unusual. When we have El Nino condition, what we, what we, what we are seeing is uh, represented by this graph over here. The blue line represents the normal rainfall in Guatemala, and in general in uh, the northern part of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. What we see here is that basically we have six months of rainfall, but we also have six months of almost no rainfall. So we have two very distinct regions, uh, two very distinct uh, seasons in the, in the, in the region. Uh, in the rainy season, we have plenty of, of water, too much water sometimes, no? So the blue over here shows the rainy season and, and shows how we have plenty of water during the rainy season. But then when the dry season comes from December to, to April, basically uh, we see uh, a lot of red indicating a lot of uh, lack of water or a, a lot of people uh, in, in need of water. So this is, the, this is the normal situation in Guatemala. This is already happening every year without even considering climate change. What has happened in the last five years uh, is represented by this brown line. This brown line comes from uh, one of our weather stations in, in the southern part of Guatemala, somewhere around here, and it's for year 2014, one of the most extreme years. And basically you see that the rainfall in May and June uh, disappeared. And this rainfall is extremely important because this rainfall is used by the farmers to irrigate their fields. Especially the small farmers rely a lot on uh, rainfall for their, for their irrigation. They don't have any uh, irrigation systems. And so small farmers are used to planting their crops in April, hoping for the May uh, rainfall. No? We even have a, a saying in Guatemala, some of you who have been to Guatemala probably heard it, no? In Guatemala we say, we are waiting for you like uh, agua de mayo, like rainfall in May, no? Uh, because everybody knows that the, the rainfall in May is like saving us, no? After six months of drought, then May comes and then we have water again. Well, the problem in 2014 is that the rain never came in May, it never came in June, it never came in July, it started to come in August and September. And so you can imagine uh, how devastating that was for farmers who had planted their crops in, in April and basically lost everything uh, because of this lack of rain. Not only that, but also once the rain comes in September and October, it comes so heavily that then we go very quickly from a state of drought to a state of too much water and flooding and possible landslides. So basically what we are seeing is that we are getting uh, the rain in, uh, in, uh, in, in the wrong timing. And once we get the rain, it comes like packed into more intense uh, rainfall. And this kind of situation has become more important in, in the so-called dry corridor of Central America. That's a, that's a concept that was coined uh, at the turn of the century to represent the area on the mountains uh, not only of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, a little bit of uh, Costa Rica, and it's basically a region where, where the risk of drought is higher than usual. And so this region over here is the one that is hurting the most from this kind of situation. And unfortunately, this region uh, includes a lot of the large urban centers in, in, the, in, the, in the area, no? Guatemala City is right here, uh, Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras, is right here, San Salvador is right here, no? Uh, Managua is right here, and so uh, these areas are areas prone to drought, but now with El Nino situation, this drought has become even uh, worse. Not so much because of the total amount of rainfall, but more because of the timing of the rainfall, like I was explaining. So what happens then is that uh, in the dry season, we really hurt for water. This picture over here was uh, very shocking to everybody in Guatemala, and this, this is showing a river. This, this, this normally is a river that is really long, at least 100 meters wide, and all of a sudden it got dry in 2016. Now the reason why this river got dry is because not only we had a series of years without a normal rainfall, but more importantly, this region over here is um, very uh, heavy in agriculture. And so during the dry season, 
uh, a lot of this agriculture is withdrawing water from the river to irrigate the fields. Now, here it's important to mention that when we talk about agriculture in Guatemala, we basically have two uh, very distinct groups. Uh, one group uh, uh, growing uh, crops for exporting, <coughs> one group working with large fields, more technology, more resources, and more irrigation to their fields. And then another group of small farmers uh, basically growing crops for their own consumption, uh, what we call the subsistence farmers. No? And these farmers are usually um, much smaller in terms of their uh, production, and they have less resources like uh, irrigation resources. Anyway, so basically in, in 2016, we had this huge problem of this river going dry. This basically uh, called everybody's attention. We have a problem here. Uh, the communities around the river, of course, complained and uh, it pushed the government to do something to try to regulate the amount of water being uh, removed from rivers for irrigation. This kind of problem, of course, disappears when the rain comes, no? So this, this, this happened in February, but then uh, in that year, uh, around uh, August, then we started to get rainfall, and then by September and October, this river was already uh, full of water again. So it's just a, a, a temporary situation, but strong enough to put a lot of stress on farmers of all sizes, small and, and large. Uh, in 2015, El Nino effect uh, turned to these figures uh, in the three countries. Uh, the top line represents the number of people requiring uh, humanitarian assistance. 1.5 million in Guatemala, 1.3 million in Honduras, 700,000 in El Salvador. They require humani humanitarian assistance because they have lost their crops, they have lost their main source of uh, livelihood. Uh, the number of uh, people in a situation of food insecurity. You can see the large numbers here for the three countries. Uh, how much of their crops they lost. In Guatemala, we have 200,000 tons of corn and, and beans. So here we're talking about, again, subsistence uh, agriculture, people producing uh, for their own consumption, their, their own food. So a lot of the corn and beans lost. Uh, in, in the three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And then the financial deficit, how, how much they lost, how much was needed to, to help these people, $7 million uh, in Guatemala, $3.4 million in Honduras, $6.6 .6 million in, in uh, El Salvador. So basically what we have is a situation where people are not being able to produce enough food uh, for their own consumption. They have to rely on external help usually the government tried to come and give them some help, but the government not having enough money, not having enough resources to uh, help these people. So a lot of these people uh, are, are really suffer, and unfortunately this is only for 2015, but if we see other years, we, we see the same situation. People not being able to produce enough food, people uh, are waiting for help from, from outside sources, but not getting enough of that help. To go on with this unfortunate situation, we have another situation in the urban areas. We have been talking about rural areas so far. In, in the urban areas, we have a situation of uh, too many people living in a very small space. Uh, Central America is also uh, the region in Latin America with the highest population growth. So we still see a lot of population increase, uh, especially in the northern part of Central America and a lot of this uh, population growth has resulted in uh, very crowded uh, cities in, in these countries. And very crowded cities mean that people are living in areas where they, they shouldn't be living. What we see over here is uh, a, a aerial photograph in, in Guatemala City, and it's difficult to see here uh, the topography of the terrain, but basically this is, this is uh, higher uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a flat area, and then this is a, r a ravine, a barranco that we call in Guatemala, and this is the bottom of the barranco, the bottom of the ravine. So the bottom of the ravine is uh, inhabited by a lower income neighborhood. And what happened here in 2015, out of a heavy rainfall, not even a tropical storm or a hurricane, just a heavy rainfall was enough to have a landslide here on the side, uh, basically burying this part of, of, uh, of this housing development 
and killing a total of 280 people. So we also see a lot of uh, problems in, in urban areas, especially uh, because people are living in dangerous uh, conditions. So what we see is that climate change is not necessarily the cause of all of this, but climate change is making things worse. We already had problems with people being poor. We already had problems with people not having enough to eat. We already had problems with people not having uh, enough drinking water or safe drinking water. And what happens is that climate change is just making all of those situations uh, even more complicated. <clears throat> now, this is, this is actually what had happened in the past. I'm not talking about models in the future. This is all in the past five to 10 years, 15 years. What can we expect in the, in the future? What, what's coming up uh, in future years? This is a graph that was developed by uh, IPCC, that panel of scientists worldwide. And this is basically a, um, uh, a scenario of what could happen in the future. Uh, modeling the future is very difficult. We can model the past. I show you the, mod the climate models for the past. But the models don't work for the future because I show you that the models needed to include the human variable to work. Remember, if we leave the human variable, the models didn't work. And so in order for these models to predict the future or to, or, or to see what's going to happen in the future, the models have to include the, the human variable. Unfortunately, humans are, we are very difficult to model. It's very difficult for, uh, to predict how we're going to behave. A few years ago, uh, a Paris Agreement was signed to try to control for emission of uh, polluting gases. But then a few years later, this uh, country decided to quit that agreement. You know? And now Brazil is also say, uh, threatening to with quitting that agreement. And so even though we come to political agreements, then it's extremely difficult to predict how those agreements are going to work out. As a result, it is extremely difficult to have a model of what's going to happen in the future. Therefore, what we have is just uh, different scenarios of what could happen in the future. And then a, a scenario could be, for example, a very optimistic scenario uh, where, where we all come to an agreement, where we all keep our word and, and stick to our agreement. And then that positive scenario would be uh, represented by this blue line over here. This blue line over here ends in the number one, meaning that in a positive scenario, the warming of the planet in the rest of the century would be one degree over what we have right now. If you remember the, f the first graph I show you on climate change, there was uh, one degree of warming already happening. So in the positive scenario, we will have two degrees of warming, double the warming of what we have right now. In the negative scenario, the red line, would be a scenario where we don't come to an agreement or uh, when we quit our agreements, and then we continue to pollute, and then the warming can go as high as four degrees on top of what we have right now. So these scenarios are uh, the, the, the brackets that indicate what could happen in the future depending on whether we stop polluting or not. If we turn to Central and South America, those scenarios uh, look like this over here. Basically what we have over here is in the bottom line, the 2.6, that will be the most optimistic scenario. In the upper part we have the 8.5, the, the pessimistic scenario, the red line that we saw in the previous graph. Over here we have the mid of the century, 2050. Over here we have the end of the century, 2100. Over here we have temperatures, over here we have rainfall. What we see is that in terms of temperatures, everything looks yellow, red, or purple, meaning everything looks hotter. So in terms of temperature, the question is not whether we're gonna get warmer or not. The question is how warm we're gonna get, depending on which pathway we follow. We're gonna have at least one more degree of temperature increase, but we can have up to four or five or six degrees of uh, warming uh, if we follow the negative pathway. When it comes to rainfall, the rainfall is more erratic, similar to what we have seen in the past years. No? Here we have a combination of brown and blue colors. The brown colors indicate less rainfall than normal. The blue colors indicate more rainfall than normal. So we see that a warming of the temperature does not affect evenly the rainfall. Some areas become drier and some areas become wetter. And we see that in Latin America, for example, uh, South uh, America, the southern part of South America, mainly Argentina, gets wetter. And this is good for them because Argentina is relatively dry. 
That's what we call the pampas, no? the grasslands in Argentina. They are getting more rainfall. They are happy because of that, because they can have better agricultural production. So there are some winners also in this situation. But if you see here, it's a little bit harder to see, but Central America, unfortunately, is in the brown area, meaning that the, the, the models and the scenarios for the future indicate that in Central America, we are going to have less water than what we have right now. This is the, the current situation, the average of 1950 to 2000 in Central America. The green means uh, an adequate amount of water, so the, mean, the green means we are okay. The blue means too much water, the, the blue means that we, we might have flooding or too much water. And the, the yellow means that we have some areas in Central America already with a small deficit of rainfall. The, these again are the, the so-called dry areas or dry corridor in Central America. So this is the current situation, but these are the models to the future. And here we are using the medium scenario. We are not using the, the worst, we are not using the, 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 the least, but the medium one. And it shows that Central America is basically becoming more uh, covered with, with the yellow color, meaning more and more areas are gonna become uh, deficient in rainfall, okay? So if we are already seeing a problem with uh, farmers not having enough, enough water for their crops, that situation is definitely going to get worse in uh, coming years as we move into the century. This is uh, an even uh, stronger zoom in into Guatemala. This is some work we did at our university. It's published in a journal over here. Uh, I take this moment to, to promote this journal. This is something we started a few years ago and uh, I'm also inviting some of you to take a look at this journal because uh, we would be delighted to have some of uh, your research being published here. This is a journal we started on climate change and biodiversity. So hopefully you'll be interested in, in looking at, uh, at, at that opportunity for publication. But anyway, basically we did the same, the same uh, for Guatemala. This is the baseline for Guatemala, what we, what we were seeing so far. The brownish color over here is the, the dry areas of Guatemala currently. But then as we move uh, in, into the century, basically the brown area gets bigger and we also get new brown areas in the northern part of the country and also in the, in the southern part of the country. So basically what we are seeing is that uh, as we move into the century, we're gonna have less and less water. And so if we are already hurting for water right now, we would hope, we would expect that situation to get worse than, uh, as we uh, move in, uh, later into the century. Let me check the time to make sure I don't take you too long from your drinks in the, in the reception. <laughs> we are almost done here. <clears throat> this is just some uh, quick results that we had from a research we did in the, in the area some years ago, working with farmers. And uh, basically we were asking farmers uh, what was causing them uh, problems. And we asked that in 2003 and 2007. When we asked in 2003, they said, well, our main problem is low prices for our crops. No, people are not paying enough for our crops. So uh, 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 prices in terms of coffee in this case was the main problem in 2003. When we repeated the question in 2007, prices were still the number one problem for, for, for uh, coffee growers. Interesting that uh, climate uh, became more important as the decade moved along. And that's in part the result of all these uh, extreme events that I was telling you about, no? And so farmers uh, started to recognize more that climate was uh, very unusual and was definitely affecting them. But even, even if they recognized climate as their main problem, as one of their main problems, it was still not the number one problem, no? The number one problem was that they were not getting enough money for their crops. And that is still the situation. Nowadays, coffee growers are not even getting paid enough to, to to cover their cost of production. And so this is what we call the, 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 the price crisis for coffee. And whenever I talk to uh, people here in the US about a, 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 a crisis in prices in coffee, they always say like, there is no crisis. I mean, I, I always pay for the same amount, even more for my cup of coffee, no? So when you go and get a cup of coffee at Starbucks or a place like that, you're always paying what, four or five dollars for a cup of coffee. So it's, 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 it's very expensive. But out of those $5, the, the growers in Guatemala are only getting pennies. And that's not even enough to, to keep them uh, uh, covering their cost. And therefore, prices are still a problem. But what I really wanted to emphasize with this graph is that <coughs> climate is only one of several problems. 
they have problems with, with their income, they have problems keeping healthy, they have problems with pests, they have pro a problem uh, being unemployed. And so basically, uh, you cannot pinpoint one single problem for, for farmers. You have to see that they are immersed in this situation, uh, uh, which, which we call a multi-stressor situation. What are they doing to, to, to overcome this? Well, when we ask farmers on the ground, so what about climate? What, what can you do about climate change? Many of them say, well, this is too much. I mean, climate is something from God. We cannot control climate. So many of the farmers feel hopeless in terms of uh, having these extreme changes. Uh, some of them are doing something, especially uh, diversifying their income. If they are farmers, they are also doing something else to try to get more income. They are changing their practices. They are getting organized. This is important. Uh, and here we have migration also. So some of them are saying, well, this is too much, unbearable, I'm going to migrate. But this is not number one. Whenever we ask people, they don't answer migration as number one. Migration is a very extreme situation. Imagine leaving your home, leaving the place where you were born. You, you make that decision only when the situation gets really bad. So people coming here to the US are not doing that because it's fun. They are doing so because they have no other option. <clears throat> so if we want to adapt to all these changes, uh, what, can we, what, what can we do? What, how can we help uh, people on the ground? Again, diversification is important, no? and this is a good uh, advice for everybody. No? If we only know how to do one thing, and then that single thing doesn't work anymore, then I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in a very bad situation. So the, the, the more diversified I am, the, the more I can confront a variable environment. Uh, uh, money, money makes a difference, no? We, I was showing how um, you, uh, the vulnerability of a developed country is very different from the vulnerability of a uh, developing country. No? If you have money, it makes a difference. No? And so we definitely need more income. We definitely need more uh, resources, uh, not only to provide to people, but also to provide to uh, governments and to provide to organizations uh, that are helping these people. No? Um, technical assistance, access to information, very important. Not only information on uh, weather forecast, but also information on markets. I was telling you that prices uh, are very important. Uh, local organizations, extremely important to help people get organized. It's easier to help farmers, to help people in rural areas if they are organized, because then you have a leader to talk to, you have um, an, an, an organized group to, to, to deliver the, the information or the help. Uh, better commercialization channels. This goes back to the coffee story, no? If, if we are paying $5 for a cup of coffee here, we would hope that at least $1 would go down to Guatemala, no? Or to Honduras or, or to Nicaragua. But that's not the case nowadays, unfortunately. More efficient use of water. At the end, this long story that I told you, Niño, Niña, it basically has to do with water, no? Sometimes we have too much water, sometimes we're hurting because we have a flooding, we have a landslide, and sometimes we, we don't have enough water. So it just makes sense to store water. It makes sense to move water from one area where it's flooding to another area where it's not flooding. But that requires money again. So we need to uh, manage our water, we need to invest more in water. And of course, early warning systems are always uh, important. So my last slide, and now we can go uh, to our uh, relaxing time. Um, basically, what we are facing here is a, a challenge of uh, um, a, a new paradigm in terms of developing the region. Basically, uh, we see that, yes, migration will always be an option if the situation uh, for these families become too uh, stressful to to be, uh, um, to, to bear, no? Um, extreme climate can definitely then be uh, a factor in reaching, in reaching that threshold. So going back to the original question, is there a link between climate change and migration? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe there is a link, but the situation is that people are already in a very bad position. Poverty, uh, violence, not uh, enough job opportunities. And on top of that, you have a bad crop, 
uh, her a bad harvest because of rainfall, that can be the tipping factor that will push people to make such a, a strong decision. Of course, uh, we have, looking at the positive side, climate change was predicted to happen in 2050 in a strong situation where it's happening already in Central America. It's happening here also, but maybe not that evident to you. you know? If you talk to people down in Guatemala, it's easier uh, for, for, for them to recognize that the, the climate is just too crazy to, to be normal. And so it's easier uh, for them to accept that there is something changing. Uh, but that gives us an, an opportunity if, uh, but because we are already in, under that situation. We are already living that situation. So we don't have to uh, talk about predictions in the future. We, we just have to figure out how to help people adapt to the current situation. So this is definitely a, a, an important challenge. But basically, we need to, um, to shift our uh, development pattern, our uh, economic growth pattern. Um, Central America, especially well, Guatemala uh, specifically, is a region that has been growing economically uh, at, a, at a steady pace. Not, not too much, but every year we have about 3% economic growth. That means that every year we get 3% wealthier. You would expect then uh, that people would be 3% wealthier overall and they are on average wealthier. But whenever there are um, estimations of poverty rates in Guatemala, unfortunately, we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, in the last three estimates of poverty rates Guatemala had in, 2000, uh, uh, in, uh, two th in year 2000, uh, a 50% poverty rate. In 2006, uh, 55%. In 2010 was the last estimate, to, uh, it was 60%. So rather than decreasing the poverty, poverty in Guatemala is increasing. So then you think, well, if we are getting 3% wealthier every year, why are we getting poorer every year? That's a difficult question to answer also, but of course, what part of the situation is that a lot of that wealth is concentrated in, in, in fewer hands. And so basically what we need to do is to think of ways to uh, create more economic growth in the area, but to have that economic growth be more inclusive, to try to bring more people uh, on board of this economic development. And with that, I think I'm done, and I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.